entertainment, insights. Don't take life too seriously. Welcome to Brainski Unleashed. Hello and welcome to Brainski Unleashed. Today we are being joined by Roger Pearson. He is an IRS enrolled agent, which actually does have a meaning. Uh, he is a master with taxes. And I thought, um, given the fact that we've got some new uh, tax things going on in the books as far as the uh, self-employment tax credit, uh, it would be worth kind of digging into that. And also just the fact that, uh, as I've said many times on this podcast, we are all paying too much in tax. So I thought it'd be kind of a, kind of a nice time to, to touch on this again. And we're getting close to the end of the year. So, Roger, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, you are quite welcome. So let's begin with what, what is that, uh, what does that IRS uh, term mean? Uh, the enrolled agent? Yeah, yes. the enrolled agent is like uh, being a PhD in the tax world. Uh, it's the highest classification that you would get uh, as far as tax knowledge. And it allows you to represent clients before the IRS, which I do a lot of also, because most people just do not want to deal with the IRS. They can give me a power of attorney and I can help them out. But, uh, and there's some various people that can do that. CPAs can do that. Lawyers can do that. But enrolled agents are the only ones that get their certification by actually tax knowledge. You have to actually take three, three hour long IRS tests, which are not fun because they're written in IRE and, uh, have all three before you get the certification. You have to renew that every three years and you have to take about 25 hours of continuing education every year just to keep up on the latest tax laws. So if you want somebody knowledgeable in tax law, that's the best type of person to find. Which is important because uh, what we've discovered through our own research is that essentially there's approximately 77,000 pages of tax law regulation and guidance that are on the books. So therefore, someone like yourself who had to do a lot of studying probably is a lot more familiar with a larger portion of those 77,000 pages versus your conventional run-of-the-mill CPA, fair to say. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just takes a lot of hours in case just to keep up on all the changes Congress makes every year. Yes. Um, and we can always rely on Congress to screw everything up. It, that's true. <laughs> so uh, recently, um, uh, what, what crossed my uh, sphere is the uh, self-employment tax credit. Are you uh, familiar with this at all? Self-employment tax credit. Yes, yeah, self-employment tax credit, SETC. And if you're not, that's okay. It's just something that happened across, you know, uh, across my desk. Uh, it involves, uh, it's from the CARES Act through the family, blah, 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 reference this and that. But basically, it's uh, there's a tax credit out there now for any of the 1099 gig workers who are getting 1040 SEs during COVID 2020, 2021. Uh, where they may be eligible up to like $32,000 in tax credits for how they were affected in COVID. Are you familiar with this one at all? Oh, uh, you, yeah. It was, part of the care, it was part of the CARES Act where you got credit for, um, uh, like if you, were, if you had actual employees in the business, you could get credit back for paying them while they were being laid off and things like that. And that also applies to self-employed people if they had to uh, stop doing what they were normally doing because of the restrictions that the government put on them. Just like if you hired employees and got the credit as a sole employer, you could also get that credit. Right. And, and so they had, the, they had the ERTC, which is the Employee Retention Tax Credit, which is the mm -hmm. first thing you mentioned. Then they had the SETC, which mm -hmm. is, uh, it's, it's gaining more attention. You see a lot more of it on, on the web. Um, it, it, the first thing I want to ask, because you are a, a tax professional, you are aware of this, it is on the books. One question I get a lot from some of my clients with, uh, with ProfitMax, again, ProfitMax, keep your cash. That's ProfitMax.co, keep your cash. Uh, one of the, uh, throw a commercial in there. Uh, one of the things that I get a lot is, is it legitimate? Can you speak to the legitimacy of these programs? Well, they're law. I mean, they're legitimate. Uh, you're, are, maybe you're referring to all the advertising that's out there right now. A ton there of is it. a yeah. ton of it. I get it across my desk every single day. And the IRS has actually come out and um, give a warning that some of these aren't quite legitimate. They're just, they're, they're, people are playing kind of a con game. They'll, they'll take your money to, to process all these farms for you. Uh, even if you don't qualify, I guess they're taking your money to tell you you don't qualify. So I'd be very skeptical of all this advertising. And I get uh, the text mails that come in about that right now are just remarkable. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm uh, quite uh, well uh, aware of some of that. Uh, the, the firm that we work with um, uh, with ProfitMax, keep your cash, 
is uh, a, a firm that will um, they'll take a deposit, but the checks go to you if you get them, and if you don't, it's in writing that you know if you don't qualify, everything's refunded. Uh, I the, one of the things that really bothers me is there's a lot of firms out there that will uh, take your money up front and then they will wait for the checks to come to them and then they will send you the checks or they'll do it where you pay nothing up front, the checks go to the firm and then you wait for them to pay you. Well, that's not a good scenario either. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, at least uh, with, with our firm, we're quite comfortable with making sure the checks go to the taxpayer from the government Correct. and not anyone else. Yeah. You know? that's, that's definitely something that should be looked out for. So uh, let me pivot for a little bit. Um, uh, one thing that we know is that 93% of business owners overpay their taxes. They overpay anywhere between uh, 31 and 74% based on our research. Somewhere in there, I'm sure that can be verified. Um, but uh, that being the case, what that would indicate is that most people who are in business are probably overpaying in taxes because they're not able to take advantage of all 77,000 pages of what's in the tax code. Is that a fair assessment? I think that's a fair assessment, uh, especially the newer people that, that this is their first business and their first time out. Um, one of the things that I get into teaching my clients, whether it's at the task desk or through my online courses, is that you need to, you, when you're going in and you're hiring a tax professional or you're hiring a CPA or an accountant or anything, you need to sit down and interview these people. You, just like you would interview. I mean, if, if you had a plumbing business and and you were to hire a plumber for it, you would sit down and you would determine whether they knew what they were doing, but you could do that because you had the knowledge to do that, well, I mean, to ask the right questions. Especially the for same, a large project. Exactly. And the same thing is true in, in, in when you're dealing with your money, your, your taxes and your accounting and everything, you need to sit down and you need to be able to interview these people before you bring them on your team. The problem is that our educational systems in this country do not teach this stuff. They don't. Right. I mean, um, for several years, I taught uh, tax classes and um, I would have business majors come into my class and they would come up to me and they say, you know, our professors, we ask our professors about this type of stuff. And they say, well, we don't teach that in college. You have to go someplace else and learn it. And that just blew me away when I first heard that, but it was consistently pretty true over the year. But, uh, so there, I feel there's three pillars that every business is built on. You, you've got to you know your legal foundations, all the different legal formats and the pros and cons of each of them, how to organize your paper. So, uh, paperwork so that not doing the accounting necessarily, but how to organize the paperwork so the people you can hire do can do the best job for you. And of course, the tax implications of each of the different legal formats. And there's a lot of things in there um, that you need to know, even if you just know the basics. I'm not saying you should be an expert on it. That's why you're going out hiring, but you need to know the basics so that you can go in and you can interview a person to tell if they're the right person for your business. So let me stop you right there because you, you bring up an interesting point with the idea of even interviewing people, right? So, uh, you know, if, if you've got a clogged toilet, you're going to call whatever plumber's available and they're going to come and they're going to run a snake and they're going to hopefully clear the drain line and you're done. So they, you don't necessarily need a, a long interview process for that. You know, can right. you fix my toilet? However, if you're going to remodel a bathroom, you know, if you're going to build a bathroom and you need a plumber or you need a contractor, you're probably going to meet with multiple ones. Why is it most people don't get second and third opinions on their accounting? Why is that? They don't see it as important. That's insane. It is insane, but you know, they're just, well, Uncle Joe recommends this person. Uh, <laughs> but did, did he know how to interview that person? Chances are not. Uh, what sometimes you, should we ask? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, some of the things, for instance, there's so many CPAs and accounting firms out there that all they do is they want you to drop everything off on their desk and say, I'll call you when I'm done. And if somebody's a bit, I would run the other way, run the other way. If somebody does that, if you're going to get a good accountant or a tax professional, they need to be willing to sit down with you and discuss your business and learn how you run your business. I mean, I've, and I've done that with my clients. I mean, I painters, and especially in their trade, 
Uh, I know how painting companies work, a plumbing company works, an electrical company works, because I've worked with all of these people that, that ran these types of businesses. And I had to sit down with them and have interviews, especially the first two or three years. It usually takes about three years before you really have a good working relationship with a professional. And, and each year you need to be sitting down and, and working with these people. They need How to be able, times? yeah. Hmm? How many times during a year should, should you be meeting with a CPA? At least twice. Uh, once when you do have taxes, but you should also be in the time frame of November, be sitting down with your accountant and also saying, okay, where are we standing? And, uh, do, for instance, uh, if you don't send at least 90% of what you're, the taxes you owe, you're going to be penalized. You're going to pay penalties. So do you need to make a estimated and additional estimated tax payment before the end of the year so that you don't incur penalties? These are the types of things that you need to know. A new business needs to know what their, their profit and loss is at any time during the year, because there's, well, we'll face it, most small businesses fail. And one of the reasons they fail is they wait for a full year before they find out if they made any money or not. Usually when they sit out and make their taxes or somebody has them a PNL, you should be doing that on a monthly or a minimum quarterly business in the first three years of your business to know where you're standing. Um, is it, is it an expectation, a reasonable expectation or, uh, it's a never thing, uh, never will happen. I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing to say that you, someone should look at their P and L. You know, I've been in business for um, 20 years, uh, just, just shy of 20 years, I guess. And uh, I've never had anyone from my accounting teams, whoever they've been as we've gone through iterations and my businesses from growth and all this, no one's ever said, hey, you know, do you know how to read a P&L? Can we, can we set your P&L up? Uh, you know, one mistake that, that we made, and, and I'll share this with my audience, is that uh, for years, we did a P&L through QuickBooks, we put things in, we got some very, very basic guidance. But when, when we try to have a business valuation done, we literally presented a bowl of spaghetti. We didn't, you know, they couldn't figure out if we were making money. And if they couldn't figure out if we were making money, then all we had was feelings that we believe were making money. And in the end, you look at it and once, once all the spaghetti is straightened out, you go, oh, look at that, you know, this is where you're at. So, what would you recommend people do? I mean, is, is this something that they should talk to their CPAs about, or are there certain courses they should take even to be able to just understand how to format your QuickBooks to read a PL? QuickBooks is probably, I mean, it's one of the most uh, popular accounting right. software out there it really right. is. But on the other hand, it's one of the most complex ones because it simple. can do so much. If you're going to, if you're going to do it yourself, you need to take a course on it. You really, really do. Uh, to understand it because it's vital when you first set up an accounting system. I mean, it can be changed later on, but it's vital if it's, it makes your life so much easier if you sit down and learn about it and set it up correctly, especially right the chart. Right of, the yeah, right out of the gate. The chart of accounts, especially, is the thing that most people mess up on. Okay. Um, then for small businesses, are they, I'm guilty of this, um, better off you know, with, with husband and wife or a partner or whatever, eh, doing the books or should right out of the gate, should they actually, if they're especially new, sign up to have a bookkeeper do it for a little bit, just so that way it's right. I would, I would find a good bookkeeper. I really would. Uh, there's a lot of little private firms out there. They won't charge you that much to do your book, at least until you're comfortable with it. If you're going to do it yourself, then you need to have some prior experience in it or you need to take the education to know how to set it up properly. Um, and you can do it yourself. The tools are out there, the software's out there, the systems are out there. But the problem with most small business people is they just wanna get out there and start working and start making money and dreams of being successful and everything else. And they don't wanna deal with the minutia of running a business or, or learning how to run a business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, being a small business person, I understand that, um, you know, uh, we, we learned the hard way that, you know, maybe we should have had a bookkeeper set us up. Maybe we should have a bookkeeper run us for a month or two, just so that way everything begins to funnel through it properly. And the books are good. You know, you get, you get, oh God, for us, it was 12 years down the road. And, you know, someone wants to look at the books, you want to get evaluation, you want to know where you're at and you go, oh, 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 what is this? You know, it's, it's a terrible situation. Um, let me talk to you about uh, CPAs for a moment. 
uh, because through some of the research that, that uh, we've done, we've, we found that CPAs, uh, typically, they all mean very well. Uh, they all care. They're all, I mean, all, you probably have some scumbags out there, right? Uh, but for the most part, there's, they're, they're, they're a class of people who are clearly the way their brains function. They love numbers. They love, they're analytical. Um, but they have a big problem, which is that they have a limitation on time. Where does that limitation on time come from? Is there, is there any way for a bookkeeper to have enough time to really, really maximize the, the tax code for every single client that they have? Or this is just not something that's realistic and practical. Should people have a team instead of just simply one CPA, but maybe you have one firm that focuses forward, what are you doing the next three to five years? coming up with a strategy, you should be doing this, this, and this. And then you've got your, your CPA who does your filing and make sure that, you know, everything, you know, all, all the loose ends are tied up. Does that make sense? Or should you just stick with one? No, no. I think it makes sense to me because most from my experience, from what I've seen in the last two decades is that most CPAs, the tax part is a side business to them. And there are so many firms, all they do is file extensions for everybody and it drives people crazy. Yeah, uh, especially when they're waiting for a K one or, or or something to come down so they can do their personal, and uh, you've got it all tied up, and that's unfortunate. Uh, if it were me giving advice, I'd say find one person to do your books, find a good tax guy to do the rest of it, okay. uh, because uh, they're going to have more time. You know, a CPA during tax time is, I mean, they've got their whole, whole accounting thing. They've got to get their year-end profit and loss statements out to all their clients so the tax that can even be done. I mean, they're really slammed already. So if you really want the best service uh, company-wide, then I would recommend too. And here's the other thing that most people don't know. I found most people assume CPAs are experts in taxes. That, that, that's just the prevailing thing out there, uh, the people I talk to. And that's not really true because... CPAs are not required to take any tax classes other than a couple of them when they first became a CPA. They have to take continuing education hours every year, but most of them take it in accounting, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very few. And so if you're interviewing a CPA that you want to also have do your taxes, one of the basic questions you're going to ask them is how many continuing education class uh, hours a year do you take in the subject of taxes? And if they don't, then they shouldn't be doing your taxes. That's, that's a great question. You know, that's actually one that I've never asked and I probably need to ask. Um, at least I think with the firm that I'm with now, I'm somewhat confident, but I'm not a hundred percent. Um, so that's a great question to ask. I think everyone should be asking that question. Uh, you know, be, based on the fact that, you know, we've identified the tax code being as complicated as it is, we all know that, um, you're probably leaving money on the table. If you don't have someone who focuses on taxes and just like you said, would you, would you put, if you had a, if you had a guess, all right. And I mean, this is straight up conjecture, you know, pulling this number out of your hat, guess how many CPAs or what percentage of CPAs in the country really, really know the tax code? Well, are we talking like 50% is a number that's astonishing, like 10%? No, I'd say 10 to 15% really are good. And there are some, there are some, they, they really, really want to be good. And they, they take the classes and they keep up with the courses and everything else. But, um, so you need to know if you're going to have a CPA do your taxes, you're going to need to know how much tax knowledge they have, or they shouldn't be doing it. Don't assume that they take a lot of tax classes and they keep up with the latest. I mean, they have to know the basics, right? But, um, especially if you have a growing business or if you have a, um, a business that you, you want to grow and sell or, or, or all those type of things, you really need to know somebody that knows what they're doing tax wise. And the other thing is that, you know, there's, there's things like if you have a business where you're buying equipment, of course you have to do what's called depreciate that. Otherwise you can't write the whole thing off a year. If it's over $2,500, you got to have write it off over multiple years. Although there's different ways to fool with that. Um, a, do, a good tax professional is going to sit down with you and going to say, okay, how much of these deductions do we need to take this year versus what is your projections to be your profit and profit growth next year? Do we need to move 
some of those dedu deductions over to next year to help compensate for that when they be just be wasted this year. These are the type of conversations a tax professional is going to have for you. you right. know? Uh, let's say, I mean, in my head, I think to myself, you know, God forbid, but, you know, let's say, God forbid, you know, uh-oh, we've got an audit. First thing in my head is going to be, do, do I want my CPA with me for the audit? Or, I mean, the quality of their work should be questioned. Is that why it's even being audited? Or, you know, should I, should I immediately focus on someone like yourself who is the expert in that situation and can help get the business owner out of a jam? The first thing I tell my client is I don't want you there because you're going to say something, which is going to spark something, uh, another question. So that's why you want to hire somebody to represent you. If you're going into a, a not necessarily a, a correspondence on it, but if you have to sit down with an edit, uh, actual auditor, you don't want to be there. You're going to say something's silly and get yourself in trouble. I've had that happen because they insisted on being there. Um, it's, it's, so you're going to want to know, you're going to want to hire the person that has the best knowledge of, um, of, of tax knowledge. Yes. And the other thing you're going to have to ask is, well, how many audits have you done? Mm -hmm. How many times have you had to sit down with an auditor and take care of this problem? Um, those are, those are the other things that you need to know. I mean, based on, you know, your, your background and, uh, you know, history, how many have you done? I've done about a dozen of them now. Okay. You know, now mo for live ones, you know, the, the correspondent thought if I do, you know, a dozen a year. Okay. Um, so it's and, a high number there. Yeah, because and those are usually correspondence audits, or I, um, uh, I have a uh, we have a back line into the IRS as a as a professional that I can get and I can work out my clients. Okay. So, I mean, if it ever happens to me, Roger, you might be my guy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, we are, uh, running a little bit short on time here. I, uh, I, I do want to ask how can people find you? I mean, first of all, I need to make sure I can find you because if I get an audit, you're my guy. So how can people find you, Roger? My corporate website is, uh, seagulltechnologies.com. Seagull is spelled like the bird, S-E-A-G-U-L-L, technologies.com. And it has links to everything I do. Um, I have uh, some uh, YouTube channels I'm working on. I have uh, some free courses on my website. I have links to my paid courses also, where I actually teach the foundational aspects of a business so that you know what you need to know. You know, it's an old thing. You don't know what you need to know until you need to know it. And um, that you can learn all of these basic uh, three pillars of the power business so that you can make better business decisions. Oh, no, that's fair enough. So that's how they can find you. Do you have any last words of advice, wisdom, anything you want to, you know, bestow upon those who listen to our fine voices? <laughs> Ask a lot of questions to anybody that's dealing with your money. Yeah, that's that's the best thing that you can do. Yeah, that's, 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 that's true. All right. Well, uh, Roger, thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure having you on. Uh, I found this to be enjoyable and enlightening and, uh, and now I got a new audit guy if I need one, so I'm thrilled. You know, you passed the test. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, please, everyone, go to that website and learn something. You know, it's, it's not going to hurt you to learn more because what we've already figured out is all of us are basically shooting ourselves in the foot while smiling and not even recognizing what we're doing. That's true. All right. Well, thank you again.